Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is Cross's Corner, and you can see uh, that we have got a fantastic guest for you today. Chettle Borsch, Norway's Olympic silver medalist in single scales. Hi, Chettle. Hi, Martin. It's great to have you with us today. And just a little word about our sponsors, Ludum, to start off with. Uh, they are a training management and performance analysis tool for sports coaches and sports groups, training groups. You can start a free 30-day trial by visiting ludum.com. So there we go. Chettle, it's great to have you with us. Uh, how's your day been today? What have you been up to? Um, thanks, Martin. It's great to be, it's great to be here with you. Um, but it's been quite, well, to be honest, quite lazy. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, quite busy, busy as well. Uh, I've taken, after, um, after Tokyo, I, I, I have barely been training and, yeah, just been traveling and enjoying life. Um, as far as I like to, to the extent that was possible during the, the pandemic, but yeah. Yeah. So have you made any decisions about um, what you'll do in terms of future in rowing? Are you going to row this year or uh, race at the World Championships? What, what's your thinking? I uh, still haven't decided yet. Um, uh, my decision will come uh, the second week of uh, February. Uh, and, uh, and to be honest, right after um, Tokyo, I was not sure, like really, I, I wasn't sure at all if I had the energy and the motivation to keep on going for another three years. Um, so, and that's why I also took six months completely off to, um, to see if I can gain the motivation and the uh, good old spirit to keep on trucking for another two and a half year. Uh, so it feels, Really good nowadays, but um, still a uh, couple of weeks until I make the final decision. You're looking really good and, and relaxed now. You, you had some time off after um, the Rio Olympics, I believe. Yeah, I did. So after Rio, <clears throat> uh, we had, of course, the national championship. And I also joined the, the Gold Cup in Philadelphia and uh, headed up to Charles in Boston. Uh, which kept me going throughout September, October. So I had maybe a couple of weeks off. And uh, my father actually joined me to the U.S. So he no. was watching the Gold, the gold Cup and, 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 uh, and the head of the Charles. And <laughs> the way I, I trained towards that was a five-day festival in, in the California desert watching Rolling Stones and uh, The Who. Uh, Paul McCartney and uh, Bob Dylan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it went good. I I um, I won the head of the Charles and I came second or third in, in Philadelphia Gold Cup. So uh, and after that, I went sailing for two months in the uh, Caribbean. So I'm familiar with taking a huge chunk of time off after big big championships. Yeah, it, it was interesting because, um, you know, you, you, you look so relaxed now. How much physical, how much exercise or, you know, uh, cross-training have you done in this last six months? Ooh, um, <laughs> to anyone listening to this, just close your ears because <laughs> do not try to copy this. I, I calculated an average of 40 minutes per week since the Olympic final. Whoa, really? Yeah. That's 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 it. Um I think it was almost a month where I didn't train at all. Like I was just eating and relaxing and having a pint every now and then. Um so it, I think it, it, it I think it reflects um how I, I was so full, I, I I was so empty, I mean, after the Tokyo Olympics. So I I didn't have any energy. I didn't have any motivation to keep on trucking. So, yeah, 40 minutes average uh, per week. So that's probably like six and a half minutes per day, seven minutes per day. Yeah, seven minutes per day. <laughs> wow, that's, that's sensational. <laughs> um, so how does your results in Tokyo seem as you look back on it now after a, a few months? <clears throat> we made a huge effort 
Um, 2021 was a, a, a season unlike any other. Um, in every in every sense of the word, I mean, with the corona restrictions and everything, it was hard to before the season started. So I, I'm just going to draw the line back to uh, European Championship in Poznan in October 2020. Yeah, uh, where I was challenged by Ole Sadler and Sadler Mason. So the three of us competed there, which I'm I'm really grateful that I actually attended. We rented a, a, a um, RV, a caravan, and we drove down to Poland and competed. Wow. Uh, but so what I'm trying to say is it was really hard to put the different my competitors into, um, like, in a strategy, like, how fit are they? Like, where, how should I row? So during the, um, uh, the European Championship in Varese, I was 12 seconds behind an old sider. Uh, yeah. 12 seconds. That's a lot. And I was so sure I had some seaweed like stuck on my fin. <laughs> 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 there were no seaweed. <laughs> and, uh, but you had an operation, hadn't you? Weren't you recovering from an operation? No, that's not a <clears throat> long, time, uh, long time ago. I okay. had a surgery in December 2017, which I uh, had a rehab for almost five months. Okay. Uh, into 2018, and then I had another surgery, January 2019. Uh, same knee, I did a meniscus uh, recession, so they removed a chunk of my meniscus. Yeah. With a, short, uh, with a shorter rehab period uh, the following months. And then I had an um, assignment surgery, uh, November 20, uh, 2019. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't something that you're recovering. Aren't the Norwegians always slow in the first World Cup? They are. They're, they are. They're, they're slowest, always slowest in the first World Cup, but they're always passed out of the box. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's it. So I, w- I interrupted you because you were talking about the progression of that yeah. season. Yeah. So I was 12 seconds behind in the European Championship in Varese. In, was it April? Um, in, in Barista. Yeah. And then I started picking up pace. And I think what's important being an athlete under a lot of pressure, well, it depends if you put pressure on yourself or not, but being able to just keep calm and trust the, trust the program and trust the process. That's really hard when it's three and a half months to the Olympics and you're 12 seconds behind and you felt like you gave it all. Um, so I progressed uh, throughout. Um, Lucerne and uh, Zagreb and Sabaldia. So I was in, in Lucerne, I think I was five and a half seconds behind. In Zagreb, I was four and a half, four seconds behind. Uh, all this under that, that is. Yeah. And in Sabaldia, I was 0.4 seconds, 0.2 seconds in front of both of them, uh, both Sven Nielsen and, and Oli, uh, which was <clears throat> not totally unexpected, but I. Um, um, I just had a lot of faith in our program and how I was, I was training and how the technique uh, was developing throughout the season because we're hibernating in Norway during the winter. Like it's hard to get the, the, the lakes are frozen, so you can't go at both, and so we have to have camps in, in, in outside uh, Norway. So you're kind of uh, rusty, like really, really rusty. Um, and leading up into the Olympics, so we got. Almost two months <clears throat> from Zabadia, one and a half, two months from Zabadia to the Olympics. So there's a lot of room for improvement. Yeah. And our, our goal was to uh, develop my boat speed, right, or develop my performance 1% more than my competitors. And um, that's a really, really tough task because that's a lot. To, like, 1% is a lot. Um, but also, <clears throat> I just felt better and better. I got fitter and fitter. And I think it's just like, uh, I didn't have any bad sessions. Like, the, you know the feeling when you're out throwing, like, ah, oh, this was a bad session. Like, it was 70%. Yeah. I, I didn't have that. I was surging around 92 to almost 100% on my sessions. Wow. Uh, just getting better and better. And of course, in, in Tokyo, with the wind and the waves and, uh, uh, external pressure and everything 
like the strangeness of it all, no art, like no audience, uh, like spectators, and no nothing, and being isolated <laughs> in yeah. an apartment. I mean, um, um, those one and a half, two months from Sabada to the Olympics was where I put down really, really good work and also built my confidence because something is a physical, but the other thing is a mental aspect of it. So, um, yeah, I, I think <clears throat> I gained most with uh, like 50 50 mental and physical that gave me that 1% more than my competitors. Yeah. So, um, thinking about that result now where you got the silver medal and, you know, having had time, I, I guess you've looked back at the race on, on TV <laughs> and, um, and watched it, or maybe you haven't, but. Um, how, how do you analyze the result of that race and your performance in that in that regatta in that final? In the final, um, that was my best race to this day. Um, really? Yeah, that wow. was really, really my best performance above everything I ever done. Um, I was I had such a narrow focus. I I peeked out of the boat maybe two times during the two thousand meters. The rest I was totally focused in my lane. And to say it in good English, I didn't give a shit about yeah. what the others did. And I was just tracking my race because I've been building up what kind of pace I can bear and what kind of pace I can I can handle. So just being focused on myself and tracking through. Um, but um, yeah, um, I was in really, really good shape. Uh, and felt like nothing could stop me, uh, especially after the semis, and just knowing that the form is building up to the, to the point. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That, that, so um, a better performance even than when you won the world title back in 2018? Yeah. Wow. Better, a better, because I had better pacing, I was in a better shape. Um, you got to remember that in Plodiv, Plodiv is a really fast course. So I think I rode uh, six thirty-eight yeah. in Tel Um and I had the most favorable lane. Um, we got to be honest about that. Uh, even though Miraskon is in the far lane, in lane number five came like a rocket in the end and towards Sunik and, and me. So it's still Tel is a fast course, and we had great tailwind turning into side in the last five hundred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in Tokyo. Uh, the wind didn't bear like we, I, I didn't get any free speed from the wind, but still I rode uh, 42, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So four seconds slower than Tobit. Yeah. And it's uh, irrational and it's almost impossible to, to, to um, like calculate the difference between races, especially from course to course or day to day or year to year. So, but uh, running that fast in those conditions are that's. It was just fast. Really. Yeah, yeah. So, so how, when in that race were you aware of any of the other, of your competitors? You said you had a, a lookout twice. I mean, are you yeah. completely focused in, are, are you like crossing the line and you don't know where you finished or what sort of awareness did you have of any race position in, in that final? I think I had like a, I didn't, I didn't look, but I just had a peek like looking to my side about thousand meter, twelve hundred meters, then another one at five hundred, and the next one was probably uh, one hundred and fifty meters before the finishing line, um, just to see where 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 I'm at. Just getting this is also about getting inspired by the situation. Like if it's a tight race, if yeah, you kind of boost your adrenaline. Um, which seems impossible because it's already an Olympic final. Like everything you've <laughs> done in your life just accumulates to this point. So, but it really gives me a good boost. And uh, yeah, um, but it's also important not to lose focus because the more I peek out of the boat, the more I lose focus on my tasks and my boat speed. Yeah, 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 yeah. How? How did your nerves compare for that Olympic singles final relative to your 
you know, the final that you rode in in 2016. Uh, and I know mm-hmm. you're in you're in the B final in 2012, but you know, yeah. obviously Olympic regatta. How how nervous were you, or how what was your your state before that race? Hmm. Um, running the single is quite special because you're walking through the boat park, see people packing up boats. There's no boats on the racks anymore. <laughs> <laughs> only, only, only the eights. And people are changing like unis and someone having a beer or singing or walking around with the medals. Um, and I always try to expose myself to that. And really? Because, yeah, it's important because I was thinking someday and then walk towards the Olympic final and this is the environment I have to walk through. Like you can't just close your eyes and go warm up and then close your eyes, go out, row. So I was like, oh, people are happy. That makes me happy. And um, like the atmosphere, like uh, I remember all of telling me, I think that was in... Ooh, 2010 in the World Championship yeah. in, in New Zealand, in Kalafira. He said, so when I go to, like, walk through the boat park, the boats are gone. People are changing suits, they're drinking beer, like, playing music. Like, then I'm all of a sudden, like, I'm thinking, God damn, I'm lucky. I'm in the A final in the Formula One class, like yeah, the top of yeah. the top, the, the men's singles yeah. go. It's like, okay, this is tough. This is cool. So that's a, like a, it's a good sign, like seeing that kind of view. You come into both park, things being completely different from the semi-final day, where yeah. everything is like stressed. People are walking, not talking to each other, like like a high tempo. Um, so I kind of familiarized with the situation and just made uh, made that to a strength. And by like nerves. Of course, I uh, put a lot of pressure on me when R and Christopher didn't make the A final. Um, and also, it was a devastating blow to the team because it's never happened before uh, for, for us. And yeah. it's, it's just, um, it was just so far fetched that they capsized at the last few hundred meters of an Olympic semifinal. So that yeah. kind of puts you out of focus. Um, and we need to refocus, and then you're sitting back in your room, lying there on the bed. Like, ah, shit. So one thing is, if they if they got the gold, then of course I need to get the gold. Yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah, not thinking yeah, like yeah. that, but that's that's a, like the um, uh, public opinion. Like that's what it, what's expected. So I didn't have any expectations, but the pressure on performing because I was less than standing. And if I failed. In the Olympic final, if I came fifth or sixth or fourth, uh, it would be a devastating blow to the Norwegian Rowing Federation, uh, concerning sponsors, concerning my economy, uh, concerning everything, like everything evolving in uh, the processes around me. Because I needed to prove that what we've done was good. I needed to prove that the system we have, uh, the technique, the physiology, the idea, that it, it works. Um, so that kind of internal pressure was probably the most dominating one. But yeah. um, I think it also, um, also being the last one, like the last man standing, also felt great, um, reg- regardless of the results of the rest of the team, uh, because. Uh, I really wanted them to perform really well. And I was looking forward to see everyone race. But just being the, the, the last standing and going out in the heat, um, it's something special about it. Like it's, yeah. It feels, uh, of course I'm nervous. <laughs> 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 but if you manage to turn it, uh, uh, those nerves into performance and like internal fire and to like, uh, narrow the focus that's uh, that's a good thing but it takes time i know that you use uh mindfulness or meditation um is that yeah. something i've read that you use it after after competition to, <clears throat> to sort of bring yourself in is that something or how long have you used that for and, and uh, how come <clears throat> you started to use it 
I started to use it the day. Um, well, actually, we, the, the beginning of it all was the day when we went out. Uh, we were kicked out of the semifinal in the London Olympics. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that was one day late. <laughs> those those because, conditions, they, there were problems with the conditions on that day, weren't there? Oh, yeah, it was. It was really unfair conditions, um, indeed. And also, yeah, like in the live women's fall and such, you could see the differences and it was measurable. And the Fairness Commission said, oh, we tried to change the lanes, but we can't change the graphic of the flags in the lane, so we got to stick with it. Which is totally insane. Which is totally yeah. insane because you're ruining people's like, people's careers. But I, I'm not bitter about that because <laughs> um, I learned a lot, and without that, we wouldn't we'd never win in, in 2013. But I think we could be battling for a medal in the Olympics because we were in great shape. Yeah. So um, we came back to our um, uh, house in, in the London Olympics, the old farmhouse in, in Eton. And um, our coach um, uh, asked us if he wanted to talk with a mental coach, which all, uh, Olaf is also using. So she was coming to visit Olaf, and she had some time for Nils, Jacob, and, and, and I. And we just talked about the experience and everything. And to be honest, when we went out, when we came forth in the semifinal, it was like a being in a car crash. Okay? Wow. Everything is going smooth, and suddenly someone just, um, like, coming from the side, crashing into you, and everything is dizzy. You can't hear the like the voices of people talking just in apathy, like you're not connected. So it was a real shock um, because we won the World Cup before the Olympics. In Munich. And yeah. So for me, it was a devastating world. But taking everything back and using uh, visualization, um, to see how the B final was supposed to be and roll that as it was the A final. So that was where it started, my, my kind of meditation and, and the mindfulness um, before and after races. So that's that's a, like that's just as important than as warming up on, on land before heading out to Olympic final. Uh, mm -hmm. I knew that. Yeah. Wow, that's really interesting. And and it's it's a practice, it's it's a regular oh. practice for you. It doesn't matter if it's the um, county championship in Norway or the Olympic final. I do exactly the same. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I, I kind of wanted to take you back. You said something about 1% improvement in boat speed um, between Zabaudia and the Olympics. And, and I was yeah. interested in what type of training do you do? <clears throat> What, what what type of work do you do to get that 1% improvement in boat speed? Is there a focus on something specific or is it a combination? What What's the, the deal with that? Um, I think that 1%. So the, I think a lot of the increase in boat speed happens naturally because I'm rowing. I just like I got another one and a half months rowing uh my body is getting fitter uh getting more used to the summer temperatures uh and and so just the basic just training like the basic training just keeps me developing uh like more time in a boat yeah. um, it's that that's just essential um so um i think more speed work being really careful about intensity uh, but also when going max, you go max. Like you do a 500 meter max, you just do it. And don't do it 92 and a half or 95%. And so intensity uh, control is really important. Um, nutrition uh, as well. <clears throat> I mean, it's hard because when, when it gets warm and uh, a lot of training, I lose my appetite like completely. So I really oh, struggle wow. to eat. Yeah. So I, I, at the worst, I've been down nine, to 91 kilos in some finals the last years. And that's, um, well, in the winter, I 
I'm around 98, 99 kilos. So it's a huge like reduction <laughs> in weight. Um, so I think bringing it back to the boat speed, it's about um, automizing the higher stroke rates, uh, the higher loads on the vascular system, like the lungs and the heart. Yeah. Um, and really, when you when I go out in the boat and do a session, I'm just gonna do it 100%. Like when I'm in the boat, that's my that's where I do the work, and not just another day at the office. Because uh, with that attitude, I would never ever uh, be able to develop the boat speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and just a, a final thing on that on that Olympic race. How surprised were you a by Oli Zeidler not making the final? What was your reaction to that? And and, and b the emergence of Antuskus in that regard. <clears throat> yeah, uh, with Oli Zeidler, um, um, that race has been in my mind for almost four years now. Uh, and uh, we analyzed the conditions in Tokyo. And um, so <clears throat> actually I was asked by the TV crew following Ole Sader. This was the day before my final in Zabaldi, I think, or yeah. the day before the day before semis. Yeah. <clears throat> they come they came visiting me at our hotel and had an interview about Ole Sader and like expectations. And since I've been like the closest I've been was five seconds behind Oli in, yeah. in the last regattas, and not making actually any improvements from Sagrib and, and like between Sagrib and and Lucien. And they said, uh, "Do you think you can beat Oli?" I said, "Yeah, of course." <laughs> well, really, you think you can beat him? Huh? <laughs> I mean, if I don't think I can beat him, what, what yeah. the heck am I doing here? Then I can just pack my bag and go home. And <clears throat> Uh, and I also said, like, it's not about beating him. It's about beating myself and my performance. Like, how much can I develop? Because um, the other assets is irrelevant for me in a way that um, I, I need to focus on myself to get the better boat spin. And it's, it's just an external motivation. Uh, of course, being close or beating them or just being beat by, like, five seconds or five tenths of a second. I, I don't know, but it's uh, with Oli in the Olympic final, uh, I wasn't surprised at all, uh, like in the semis. Uh, unfortunately, I saw that coming uh, many years in advance uh, because I've seen how he handles rough weather. And, um, <clears throat> but uh, during the Olympics, I thought that he would be definitely be in the, in the final. Uh, because the conditions weren't that bad. The waves weren't that big. Yeah. Uh, the wind wasn't that strong. Well, in the heat, it was, it was strong. And maybe in the semis, I can't remember. But, um, I, was, I was surprised, to be honest, that he, he didn't make the, the final. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because I thought would, the, the conditions would be much rougher, like in the Junior World Championship year uh, before. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, oh, 2019 was it, right? Yeah, in, 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 in Tokyo, like the conditions were crazy. Uh, straight on tailwind, a lot of waves the last 1,500. So I was kind of picturing that just a little bit more from uh, from the stern to the from the left. Uh, so yeah, I was really surprised. And I was, uh, I was watching the race and I was like, oh, shit. And I said that and I was like, um, I felt bad because I really want one and Oli in the final um, uh, because it's been like slightly Oli and me uh, almost all the way. Yeah, uh, yeah. The three of us. And I knew that uh, Slady would most likely uh, quit rowing. And I wasn't sure if this was going to be my last Olympics. So I just wow. wanted the, yeah. the trio to be, be in the final because I want an honest race. I want man against man, head to head. And I remember because um, I was cooling down on my bike and I went looking for Ollie. He was in the Erdling in the, um, above the, um, the boat uh, storage, the boat holes. And I talked to him. Um, I genuinely felt 
story because I didn't exactly where he is, well, where he yeah. was in, yeah. in 2012. 12. So I could really, really feel it. And uh, yeah, I said to him, like, uh, I know it's not going to help, but I'm going like, to row your race uh, in, the, in the final. Um, and that I know he's going to be back stronger than ever. Um, uh, yeah, it just just feels so strange because the conditions yeah. were, I, I didn't picture that. But as I said, I, I, I kept those conditions in my mind for four years and I pictured he would have difficulties performing at his best, but yeah. And with the degree, um, that was not unexpected. Uh, we had him in our binoculars <laughs> that <laughs> season, but uh, I was in such a good shape uh physical form that I he uh, we had we had more focus on on uh, dummy and Martin and Fer like focus if you know like just yeah. being aware <clears throat> and I think um, um, I'm, I was super disappointed not uh, being first and in everything I could to try to get those. Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, first, but um, that was just a, that was a surprise. Um, even though we've, he's been on, on our radar for, for quite a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't say surprise, I mean, because I, I never been in a better shape. I, 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 I was at the point I'm just trying to like take my mind back to the day. It's like, you gotta be in um, like you gotta have the best day of your life to beat me today. I, I had that mindset, and yeah. I just I just felt like um, I really want to race the perfect place, and I felt that I uh, almost had the perfect race. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's 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 the cool thing about rowing. It's um, uh, things like that happen. Um, even though it's really like it sucked, <laughs> it was really bad. But um, that's motivating me to keep on for another Olympic cycle. So I think if I won in Tokyo, I'm not sure if I would continue. So yeah. maybe uh, that was meant to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Disappointment was huge, but but still. Um. What, you've had some great races. I, I watched the 2021 uh, World Cup at Zabaldia where you had that outside lane and uh, it was a magical race between you, um, Sferi and Oli Zeidler. Um, and then, of course, around that race, there was um, subsequent after the Olympics, there was a lot of uh, controversy. You were disqualified and you wrote something quite heartfelt on, on social media, and then World Rowing came back with it with its own comments. Yeah. Um, how does that all feel now to you, that, that, that episode? And, and, and... <clears throat> I, I, um, I feel it was, an, um, it was important to me to just let people know, and at the same time, let them know that what I did breaking the commercial rights is wrong. And I also wrote that in uh, Instagram post right after the Sabadell World Cup. Uh, and um, well, the fact that I brought my rubber can on the podium, I, um, as I wrote to to to, to World Rowing and apologized for the for the episode, I said I was uh, I was just on another level. I, I wasn't I, I didn't have contact with the real world, so I, I, yeah. I didn't realize. I uh, I was completely <laughs> conscious about those actions, and for that I'm really sorry. And I, and I was expecting to pay a quite high fine, and uh, 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 not being disqualified. Um, yeah, that was quite harsh. And so with a middle like. I get that they want to, because I, I've done it a few times before with the drinking bottle, uh, having it like somewhere on the podium or like 
because I'm, I'm drinking a lot. <laughs> yeah. Super dehydrated. So I put my flask away, but it's still in the angle or on the podium. And um, and also in, in Zagreb, I had a Technogen logo um, on my uh, running shirt. On my, yeah, on, on, on the uni. Yeah. That was, they said that was not allowed, but I also asked the um, the judges in in uh, Varese during yeah. during the European Championship if that was allowed. They said yeah, and I raced with the exact exact same suit in Varese, and I actually asked the the empires empires yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah. So I thought that was good. So they added uh, that with another flask on the podium, uh, somewhere on the podium, not in my hand. And also with Sabadia, and I thought, okay, now I just got to make an example, and we're going to disqualify him. So um, I do not support that uh, decision, but in some way I can respect it uh, because I I can't do anything else. I can uh, and I ask for a um, delay, what do you call it, like a postponement in in the um, um, time limit to. to um, come with a response because the Olympics was coming up. I just wanted to focus on that. So I asked, can yeah. you do this after the Olympics? They said no. Because I could have taken this to the, um, the sports court and, and ruled out the case, but that was that was out of the question. Out of the question. And when the time limit is, is what it is, I think it was two weeks, I was like, okay, I'm just going to not mention anything and I pay the fine. I'm going to be disqualified. I'm going to return the medal. I have to withdraw my ambassadorship for uh, at an ambassadorship in IOC. Uh, really? Yeah, and also um, at the start, they uh, it was um, I lost my rank into the Olympics. Yeah. So it was like four big things. One thing is like putting the medal in the envelope and giving it back, but the revo- revo- uh, revocement of my ambassadorship. Uh, that was quite harsh. That's very harsh. Uh, because it, because it, my ambassadorship was about fair play and um, game manipulation. And um, it was an honest race. And I, like, like the game was, and so when we mix performance with commercial rights, um, we're going in, on a path that's hard to navigate. And I think, um, well growing um, just made of their mind and I said that we've done this with several crews before and I got pictures of so many crews doing exactly the same what I did with their flags on, flags on the podium for yeah. sev- uh, several years but uh, and I really wanted to write a re- uh, response with all my picture evidence of every other case that's happened to so many yeah, crews yeah. but it was like I'm not going to be that guy. I'm just going to accept it and go to the Olympics. Yeah. Uh, but I was really close, uh, involving uh, involving uh, several lawyers and um, and hitting back. But it's it's no use. It's no use. Uh, what's happened happened, but it was my fault bringing that can up to the podium. And but the consequences were beyond what I imagined. And uh, I would rather pay a twenty. Thousand euro fine, <laughs> then let's yeah. my medal. <laughs> yeah. And and like and or like if I could uh, as to 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 repair the damage, uh, set like ten thousand euros to a uh, fund for uh, promising sc- scholars from developing countries or like something constructed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just it was only punishment, and and mm-hmm. so I, I I suggested that, but. Um, yeah, it didn't it didn't work uh, because I would I would rather spend uh, twenty thousand euros of something that could inspire yeah. someone or like help someone instead of. Uh, but I, as I said, I respect Kisa's decision, and uh, even though I don't agree, I still respect it. Yeah, personally, I I thought if they were going to do something, then a fine would be appropriate, but not not a disqualification. Because I saw that Sverry Nielsen said, you know, he he did not want that medal. Um, you know, please don't send me the medal. I, I saw that he said that. Um, yeah. And and it was also because it was such a fantastic race as well. Um, yeah. It it was it was just a brilliant contest. 
Um, yeah. Somebody, somebody watching, uh, Ben the Orr has put a question on Chettle, which is kind of linked with your thoughts on that. Um, so, do you think rowing should generally be more open to sponsoring to make it more attractive? Uh, I don't think rowing should be more open generally uh, to sponsoring uh, to make rowing attractive. Um, I think it's important for road rowing to protect the, their sponsors, and I support that. That said, um, it should be a commission and maybe a survey uh, that could circulate um, through all the different federations and to like, how can you make rowing more attractive? Because sponsors is one thing. So you, you're allowed to have sponsors on your suit and your product sponsor and your country flag and also on your shirt and on the boat. So there's several uh, marketing spots, uh, really. But I think um, um, to keep rowing alive, to be honest, because yeah. the way we do it now, uh, I have strong doubts that rowing is going to survive in the next 20 years in the, on the Olympic program. Really? Uh, yeah. Because we, we, did a, we, did, we did a gender equality and made that into from uh, to Rio and towards Tokyo. And that's a really good thing, even though it meant that uh, some of the classes were reduced or disappeared uh, to Paris Olympics. But um, that's a good move and the right decision, but that's with equality and diversity. The other thing is with the commercial rights and uh, making rowing attractive. And I don't say the more money rowing gets, the more attractive it, it gets. That's, yeah. that's not that's not the line I'm, I'm drawing, but um, uh, like beat rowing, much more action. Another really? kind of game format is more like for us who love rowing. I, I, I really hope rowing stays on the Olympic program forever. But seeing the development of other sports, uh, like traditional versions of, um, of uh, sports, like being slowly phased out and a new one comes in. Yeah. yeah. Um, like climbing. Uh, like climbing. Um, but also within the sports, like alpine skiing. Um, um, where you see you get ski cross, you get twin tip, you get snowboard and, and, and skating. So things are, and it's only, they can only fit as much into the program. And the IOC is depending on commercial rights and commercial money. Um, so if it's not attracting gears, then they try to not push it out, but to like say, okay, we, how can we make this more interesting? Um, and that's a big challenge. So I think, um, I mean, no, that's the challenge. And it's, uh, I'm not sure if it's confirmed or not, but uh, is it going to be 2,000 meters in Los Angeles? No, I think it's less than, it's going to be 1,500. Exactly. And um, I spoke with a lot of us, like, that's nonsense. There's several running courses around. Yeah. But, um, I don't know what happens between closed doors or the communication between road rowing and, and the IOC, but um, I'd like to row 1,500 meters. I, I wouldn't mind, but it's moving in the direction to a different sport. Yeah. And um, also implementing beach uh, sprints on the Olympic program. Uh, so I'm, and, and I'm not saying I'm like highly concerned. I'm not, but I am... Uh, just saying that that's something we all got to work on and, and collaborate with World Rowing and with our federations to come up with ideas and ways to make rowing more yeah. uh, attractive. And I think the first way to do it is to have good media coverage, good video and camera from the races, having hard, hard rate sensors on the athletes, having graphics, yeah, like yeah, more yeah. modern, because you see that on uh, like, uh, traditional alpine skiing like slalom and stuff you have g4 sensors you have heartbeat uh, like heart rate sensors and the shortest line and angles like so much data and it's just opens up another aspect of the sport and i think yeah. that could be cool in running as well 
Yeah. Do you, uh, Red Bull, uh, uh, Red Bull, uh, a good sponsor to have for you. How does how does their their sponsorship work for you? Oh, very good. Um, I am <laughs> very grateful that they stayed on. We had a good year in 2013, and then we got onto the Rebel team. We didn't deliver the goods in 2014 in Amsterdam. We didn't make the Olympic uh, qualification in 2015, so it was almost three years without almost no results, not, almost no medals. But they still um, kept me on board and still uh, supported me. And uh, I know it, it was a controversial sponsor, but now it's more normalized. Yeah, and yeah. without them, I wouldn't, I would never be where I am today because then I had, um, I had to like private prioritize it in another way, get a job, spend less time growing, uh, less time getting restitution. And yeah, and we, we're not paid by the federation to row. So, um, they, uh, our clubs are paying for our camps. So the federation sends our clubs bill like, um, um, like a cost um, bill for yeah. our camps. Yeah. So we, we don't get paid and we have money. It's well, Norway's expensive country to live. <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, um, they, they, they are a really good sponsor. But instead of saying sponsor, I see say more like um, um, uh, collaborative work because they also care about my performance and they. Have a big performance center in Austria with the, like the state of the art equipment and data and tests and everything, and with research. So they're more than just an energy drink uh, manufacturer. They really want their athletes to excel, and um, yeah, they, they, they've um, they've been a really really good support. Yeah, talk to me about that 2019 singles final, um, Chetel, because it you know I think I remember saying in commentary it's probably one of the greatest singles races of all time um and uh it it, it was remarkable uh with five yeah. scholars I, I think maybe within a second of each other um that's right so in Lynx 2019 in the world championship <clears throat> uh i remember <laughs> <laughs> the days leading up, I that was one of the first times I really felt like, okay, I'm not ready. <laughs> oh, really? I was, yeah, I was out on the course and rowing, and Johan was following the live weights uh, double with Ada and Christopher. <laughs> and I remember I got almost angry with Johan, like, Johan, you gotta, you gotta, like, can you please just hold me for 1k? <laughs> please, just, I feel shit. It's like, the rhythm is wrong, my breathing is wrong, the boat doesn't feel right, there's waves, there's eights, yeah. there's like everything was wrong. <laughs> uh, it took me a lot of like, mental energy to just like trust what we, we've done and like try to channel uh, positive energy into the semi and, and uh, the final. So no, I, I was, I knew that I was not in a great shape in 2019. I was at uh, 97%, maybe 96 and a half, and not 99 or almost 100. So I knew that I had to do something, like pull something out of the hat <laughs> the last 500, if I was uh, ever to be in the medal, uh, like the contestants of the medals, because I, I knew it was a strong lineup, a really strong lineup. And I was right, it was a race to the, really a race to the line. So um, I remember having a decent start. I didn't use too much energy, which I did in the, um, in the semis. Yeah. In the quarter, I think, I went up like lightning, and I had a great gap down to the others and just controlled it. But that's a race when you roll on other rollers' performance and not your own performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had to change that into the final. And so just letting... Sweaty and all you just do their thing, get the length or so, and just sit and work, sit and work. And I was surprised when I crossed like uh, 1250 meters looking, looking to the right, like, ooh, I'm pretty close. This is not too bad. And then I decided, just, I just need to go. I just need to go. I know that physically, maybe this will never ever, like, I, this, this will never last in the line, but I need to go because if I don't go, 
Chris Gunn is going to see, oh, I'm almost, yeah. I'm almost at the same line of Cheto. And then he gets inspired. Then yeah, everyone yeah, just yeah. goes off. So I just, I think it was around 500 meters, like 600 meters. Like, okay, what the heck? I'm just going to go. <laughs> <laughs> I completely burst at the last 120, 150 meters before the line. And oh, I thought really? I ended up, yeah, I thought I ended up fifth or sixth. Uh, so I was really surprised to see that I got the third third place. It was such an amazing race. And so many scholars leading, then going yeah. back, and another scholar leading. And um, I, I hope there was fair conditions. It was quite flat. So I yeah. really hope that it was fair, fair racing. And um, no, really, it was, <laughs> it was awesome. Um, Right, because I, I thought mm, the scholars in the A final they're already going to Olympics for uh, so it, yeah. it can be kind of an anti climax to uh, yeah. to be in the A final like they made it but I knew for uh, Swati and Ollie and me uh, it was like it's going to be a race to line anyway <laughs> we don't we don't care if we qualified or not. <laughs> So no, it was an awesome race, really. And uh, doing that performance with what I had um, from before, and I was um, I was satisfied. It was a good race. Yeah, um, I, I'm interested that race you had at Henley with Mahe Drysdale because that that was uh, incredible. You're breaking up. You're breaking up, Martin. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <I can't> <laughs> Well, it, it, yeah. it, was, it was the same year that you won the world title. And yeah. I, I'm guessing there were lessons learned from that race. Uh, but physically, you must have rode yourself completely to a standstill. I, I just wonder what that feels like yeah. because, um, you know, it, it's quite brave to do that. You talked about that in the 2019 final of, of physically go, of going early and then physically, yeah. you know, the last 150 metres or so, you, you had practically nothing left in the tank. Yeah. So <clears throat> there's many similarities between the race in 2019 and, and in 2018 in Henley. Uh, except I, I, um, I disposed my energy um, in the Henley race as I did in the semi in Linz. So I went out quite strong, had a high speed, got a huge gap and just sat there. But then I forgot, well, in Henley, I was uh, physically, I was in okay shape. But I had like almost four, three lengths of my or something. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I was really relaxed, but I just wanted to like truck, like push on, push on. And I forgot that um, there's current coming from my, like from in the opposite uh, direction of speed, and, and also it's not two thousand meters. So yeah. when I passed two thousand meters, I was done. I, like, yeah. My my brain is preset on two thousand meters. Or so when it was one hundred and twenty or so meters left, yeah. I was like, no, 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 no. Like everything just ran out. I had no like no calorie. Really, I didn't have anything left. And he, like, I just passed. And it was a phenomenal race. And um, I'm so happy I did it. Like, I'm so happy I um, said in good English, I had the balls to just go when it was 650 minutes left. I just, okay, I just got to go, 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 because this is how it's going to be in the European Championship. This is how it's going to be uh, in the World Championship. So just go out there and just, just leave it out uh, on the course. Um, but I, I kind of forgot that I wasn't in like a super good shape. So yeah, yeah, passing 1950, 2000 meters, having a little bit more than 100 left, I was just to totally cold and had nothing left. Yeah, and yeah. I remember <clears throat> I um, everything hurt. Like I, I crossed the line. Um, um, I didn't know how to get in. I like back onto the pontoon. <laughs> really? <laughs> like, yeah, I was, I was rolling probably with my lap like this i just tried to roll but like it didn't feel like it i uh, went anywhere so i came onto pontoon and the first that met me was was my coach and um sir stephen regrave and um, he pulled me out of the boat and gave me a hug and said this is perfect this is perfect this is exactly what you need well done mate uh, i was i was this like 
Uh, well, I came second. Like I didn't win. Like yeah, I know, I know, I know. That's 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 good. That's good. This is gonna like propel you forward to the to the world championship. Um, so at the at first I didn't know what the heck he was saying because uh, I just burst like a balloon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but he was right, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot from that race with um, how to dispose, how uh, to to um, plan where I'm supposed to leave the energy out in the course and uh, where to make the push and stuff. So and really, just by racing that race, I felt like I. I just made new ground, like I made a new standard and yeah. could like climb over my, what I thought wasn't poss- possible. So uh, yeah, that yeah. was an uh, important race. Yeah. And was it a big deal for you winning the European Championships? Was that your first big win in the single skull? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was. It was. <clears throat> um, yeah, winning a European Championship uh, was... Awesome. All of a sudden, I wasn't there. Uh, was Sveden? I, I don't can't think remember. You uh, no, I don't think, uh, I don't think it was there. So I knew, even though I won, I got two hungry wolves in, yeah, yeah. in Germany and Denmark just <laughs> waiting uh, to get uh, to let out of the cage. So um, I was, of course, I was happy because it meant that all the hard work I put in from December when I had a surgery, December 2017, until March, April, May, uh, paid off because I knew that, okay, now that was good rowing. I need to think like to get a somewhat better technique and more efficient and build a little bit more capacity. But um, it was so cool giving back to all the people that helped me in 2018 the rehab and on everything being patient with me and also my coach letting me row the single because yeah. i was i rode with one leg for two months so i was definitely the like Birgit uh was passing me like she was passing me so <laughs> yeah. just, uh, <laughs> uh, just being allowed to to um, keep it in my own pace and building up my kind of regime how 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 can I become the best rower without doing compromises and letting people down because I'm in a boat with with people less not injured? Yeah, um, yeah. that was really it. Really made me um, uh, well. I took a step to another level as an athlete. I think. Yeah. Um, how much work do you do on the rowing machine on the ergometer, and and which one do you use? Um. Um. On the erg. Uh, with our old program, um, I wouldn't roll that much. I will say I'm probably the athlete in, in, in the world rolling pool that rows uh, the least, probably. Really? Um, yeah, all year around. Yeah, definitely. And on ERG, I rarely had a session longer than 16K. Yeah. So that would be probably two times 8K or uh, three times 20 minutes. But really rare that I was above 60 minutes or 75 minutes on ERG. So I didn't roll that much. And I used a mix of the concept and the arbitrary. And uh, sometimes also the technogen um, yeah, yeah, yeah. the the skill work to get the, the magnetic resistance. For strength training, yeah, but um, yeah, um, so it's going to be exciting now with a new new coach and see how uh, the increased amount of erging and rowing over is going to affect. Who, um, who's the new coach? Uh, Mark from uh, the Dutch. Uh, oh, Mark Emke. Coach. Yeah, Mark Emke. Ah, oh, wow, that's really interesting. I used to race against him. Um, what, what, what's your t- <laughs> do you ever do the? Have you done the two K test that the, the on the on the concept two? Uh, if I did a two K test on the concept, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. My personal record is from twenty thirteen. It's uh, five forty seven. Oh, so back in twenty thirteen. Oh, that's really yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah, so I had an injury. I had a back injury. <clears throat> Um, like overuse injury, nothing big. 
And I went to see a Pilates coach um, uh, at the top sports center in Norway, as well as my um, sports psychologist. And I remember I was so sick and tired of just adjusting all the time of being able to row. So one day I was like, showed up uh, training. I was all alone. It was Wednesday morning. Like, okay, I'm just gonna do a two K test. I don't care. I just need. I just need a test. <laughs> so that was uh, that was really really cool. And I never beat that result. So my goal is to do that the next one and a half year. Get a new. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, we haven't talked about uh, there's there's a one one elephant in the room um, in terms mm-hmm. of your relationship with uh, Olaf Tufta and. Um, we haven't talked about your doubles race in Rio. Um, mm-hmm. And I know there's a nice story around that. I know you were flying going into that race. You had a fantastic semi final. Yep. Um, and, you know, you probably thought you could take on um, the Croatians. The Sinkovic, yeah. The Sinkovic brothers. Um, yeah. But it wasn't so good in the final, in the first part of the final. No, no, no. We uh, struggled in the waves. We had um, we uh, only had we rode together since February uh, 2016, so we didn't have the experience with waves, and we experienced that in, in Brandenburg as well. Uh, of course, yeah, yeah, that was terrible. Yeah, that was terrible. <laughs> that's that's exactly what it was. It was uh, horrible conditions, and um, here we nearly sank. In, in Brandenburg. So um, I remember after 200 meters, I thought, um, shit, it's happening again. That was like no Olympic medal this, this Olympic cycle as well. Because the, the other guys just went off. We were yeah. fourth or fifth or something. And I remember all of us, the 250 meters said, Easy, easy, easy. Just take it easy. Like, like is he mental? Yeah, I know he's mental, but it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and so we start using less energy and just keep the blades in the water when it was possible. And just try to get as much air under the blades going back for a new stroke. Yeah, yeah. And from the past meter, I was on fire. I said, to Olaf, like, we go, let's go, let's go, let's go. We just pushed and pushed. And so he was actually one doing the calls. But I was like, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, it went really, really fast. And um, it's uh, that's that's how it is with the outdoor sports. The, the the conditions are the thing that rules, and you can't do anything about it except training to get better. Uh, and I really regret not being in a in a boat with all of maybe a year earlier um, to get experience and like do all the adjustments. Because it was only February um, until like March until August, we had like you know, yeah. time to row together, and yeah, it was it was cool having like getting my first Olympic medal. But in the semi, I really knew that we can cross to like we can cross the Croatians. Like yeah, yeah. I was so confident. Like they are so nervous now because we pushed them so hard. And in the semi, I told all of the last. Two hundred. and said, "Let's go." And he said, "No." And I was, I was, I was like, I was furious with him when he crossed the line. I was like, "Creation said, because we could beat them, we could like, yeah. like break their backs." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're good friends of mine, but, but yeah, yeah, in, yeah, a, yeah. in a in a competition where competitors, and but we got to say that for the final. I was like, "Okay, okay, okay, okay." Uh, but still, still, we could have beat them, and I remember. Um, um, I remember um, Martin just having a hard time going up the stairs to the press zone, like he was holding onto the rail, like he was eighty and couldn't walk. And I was like, "Shit, we really pushed him hard." Yeah. And I was just jumping around. I had a lot of energy, so I was. Um, um, I really look forward for for to the to the Olympic final in, in Rio. And the conditions were just not the conditions that's favorable for us. So yeah. that's how it is. That's happened to my competitors when I've been going single and vice versa. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. how it is. Yeah. 
what what's it like, Ryan, with someone who's got so much going on in his life, like Olaf Tufta? Because <laughs> I, thought they were, I thought they were going to say so much going on in his head. <laughs> or in his, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, um, it's um, a good experience, and I'm really grateful to uh, have been on a team with Olaf uh, because he learned me a lot. It's also, uh, we both got huge egos, <laughs> of course, and we both take up a lot of space. But we didn't have time to quarrel. We didn't have time to make conflict. We sat down with the coach and we just grew some, made some rules and how we're going to act uh, and how we're going to develop and how we have to like uh, collaborate and just make, um, make the boat as fast as possible on such a short notice in such a short time. Um, and in that uh, process, we both learned a lot. Um, yeah. It was really cool. Uh, I've never seen all of that patience and just accepting because even though we're we weigh exactly the same, we got like same body weight and height and reach and everything, we're practically uh, quite like similar. Um, yeah. But um, in terms of physiology, we're uh, completely different. So all of you can roll oh, yeah. for 24k in high altitude. If I roll more than 12, was 15, 14, I'm, 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 I'm done. I'm done. Like, I, I, I can't do that. So we always had to make adjustments, which I know. And by adjustments, I mean reducing the amount of training for me and also reducing the amount of training for all of me in the double. Yeah. And so that was hard for him to accept. But at the same time, um, I'm pretty sure he knew that if we didn't balance that good enough, it could be fatal. So... Um, and at the same time, me, because it's hard, throwing with a double Olympic champion, an Olympic silver medalist as well from Sydney, and saying like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to train that much today. And say that to a uh, figure of authority and, and also yeah, with yeah. His, his results. But I just had to trust it and because I knew that what, what, what would work for me. So, um, but... Uh, yeah, I'm really grateful to have had that experience and really uh, fast forward my experience and like develop myself as a, as a rowing role, role adult. Yeah. That's really, I, I just wanted to ask you, um, we've been talking for more than an hour now. Um, I, I just wonder, um, your first world title in 2013, mm -hmm. that was a magical afternoon um, yeah. for Norwegian rowing, and you were very much part of that. Uh, yeah. How was it, your first world title? In um, 2013, it was... Uh, <laughs> I remember the day before. <laughs> I think it was the day before, yeah. When uh, Arden kissed off in their life, like men's double, they won, and we were in this last set. And... Uh, by a rest area in the hotel I'm like yeah guys come on come on come on and across the line and then suddenly just stopped cheering like mm, shit <laughs> 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 because we knew like no matter like if if it's not a gold medal it doesn't matter and yeah. like shit and but at the same time like we've been doing the exact same as lightweight so like okay Nils is saying like God damn, we, we, we can do this. We can do this. Like this, it's, it's tomorrow's going to be our day. It's going to be our day. And uh, it was really cool uh, doing that race, leading from start to finish and just establishing the dominance in the, the mid 500 from 750 to 1250 with a huge gap to the next uh, line of boats because it was actually just us. And, and then you had the Lithuanians and the Italians just, uh, yeah. just a few meters in front of the rest. And it was such a cool race, even though you see back at the technique and stuff, like I rolled like uh, a <laughs> I can never roll before. <laughs> but the way we rode in a, in a way was so kind of efficient as well. And the boat just flew. It was such a cool race, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so um, what's for you... Uh, what, what have you got lined up in 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 the next week or ne next few weeks? What are you What are you doing at the moment that to keep you interested during the day? 
Um, still training a little bit, so I'm trying to get one session a day. Um, and yeah, no, I'm going to Italy with my mom <laughs> for wow. five years. <laughs> yeah, I promised her a uh, travel after the Olympics, so we're going to, to Rome and then spend some time in Italy and then join the team and see how it feels and make a decision. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, Chetley, it's been amazing to talk to you today. You've been great to listen to. Uh, some really yeah. interesting things, particularly talking about your Olympic uh, final. Um, brilliant. We'll end the live part of this interview now, but thank you very much, Chetley Borch. You're an absolute star. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. <laughs> Likewise.